The listener was on record for, I was only 15, 45, when he started to, uh, to, to make records with, with Bird. Uh, I wasn't going to clubs then. But uh, when I was 18, I was sitting in one night in the, uh, in the Mittens, which uh, I, I look back and, and I absolutely am amazed by my courage. I went up there by myself, drove my, my parents' car over the bridge from Queens, parked it, went into Mittens, asked Abdullah Buhena if I could sit in with him. It took a lot of nerve on my part, because I wasn't that good then, frankly. I mean, I, you know, I'm talented. I was 18. <laughs> and he said, yeah, sure, no problem. And I sat in, and when I was packing up my horn at 3 in the morning, and Miles was at the bar, I saw him, and he came over to me and asked me if I wanted to make a rehearsal at Nola's for a gig. So uh, I was being cool. That's where the cool was born. I said, sure, man, I'll come. You know, yeah, yeah, why not? I mean, <laughs> I was, my heart was pounding, you know. I mean, he, he, you know, he'd been around long enough to be my hero. Uh, and uh, it was a, a great moment in my life, one of, one, of the, one of the greatest as far as a career, you know what I mean, as far as music is concerned. What was the gig? What was the rehearsal? This man at the end is for me. I may move into... My son is still here, so this is cool, but... Okay. So what was the gig? So you go to NOLA, did you know what it was for? What no, I had no was? idea. I had no idea what it was for. When I got there, I got, uh, I, I saw all these people I, I, I loved and heard of, and I, I knew none of them. Uh, the atmosphere was really nice and warm, and there was no problem whatsoever. Uh, I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't uh, initiated in any way. I sat down, and I was always a good reader. I read the parts, I, and I always had a good sound. Uh, when I asked Miles later, much later, when I was interviewing him in the, in the 80s, maybe, huh? I asked him, I finally got the courage to ask him why he hired me. And he said, I like your sound. So that's good enough. And uh, uh, so I had a good sound I could read, so, you know, there was no trouble. Uh, he, gave me, he tried to be nice and he gave me a few solos. Uh, I don't like to listen to him now, but, you know, who does? Anyway, uh, the rehearsal was the, the band, the Tent Head, the, the, no, none it that became The Birth of the Cool. I don't know who called it that, do you? Who called it The Birth of the Cool? It wasn't called it then, that I'm sure. I think somebody put it on a record maybe after it was reissued. Somehow like that. The record was made in October. I, I, I was going to school and this gig was in September. I asked Miles if he had any more work. I would have quit school in a minute. He said no. No, nah, you know, he was probably waiting for JJ. I mean, I was, you know, he wrote in his autobiography that J.J. was busy, so he got this white cat. <laughs> but I have to tell you, he was always nice to me. I never got any vibe from him in, in, in any way, you know. I mean, it was always, afterwards, it was always a hug and a kiss. At the time, I, have, I had no problems with, uh, with, you know, the emotional side of it. I did the, the, the gig. I thought I did it well. Apparently, I did. He didn't bug me. And uh, I had a good time. And... Uh, um, it was a good gig, but it certainly wasn't one that I thought would exist in history 50 years later, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's the weird part. Well, the music that you played at the time, was it somewhat different than stuff you had played before? What was your take on the arrangements and the, just the way the band sounded? Uh, good musicians. I had listened to a lot of Claude Thornhill, you know. He was, uh, he was one of the people that opened things up for me. So I knew I knew the uh, the, uh, the Jerry's and, and Gill's uh, sound and the voicing. I'd never played their voicings before. I, I, I learned a lot, especially from Gill, from how you write a trombone or any part, but how you write a trombone part so that the part itself becomes a melody. And it's so much fun to play. And that's why people sound better when they play his, his arrangements, because you play those things and, and you know you sing the melody out. It's not just filling in the third, fifth, sixth, or whatever of the chord. Uh, and Jerry too, of course, you know. And so for me, it was a big step forward. I, I don't remember being blown over. Uh, no, it was a good gig. The music was challenging. It was good. And I was very happy. That's still around. Yeah. <laughs> now, after that, you, you when did you actually split New York? What year? When I split a few times. What was the first time then? I went to school in Miami. It was '48, I guess. Uh, '47, because I came back for the summer and I did the gig. I had did I had another gig that summer with, uh, uh, I don't remember the leader, but it was at, uh, it was at the, the something, uh, the ballroom in Harlem. What was the name of that ballroom? Uh, Autobahn? No, but like that.
Rockland Palace? Uh, no, but like that too. It'll come for me. Anyway, it was a band uh, that Al Killian was playing lead trumpet. And, uh, and Mel Lewis was playing drums, actually. We were the same age and it was like our first gigs. I think it was, you know, the two of us started that summer uh, on, I mean, professional gigs. And uh, at the time, playing with Al Killian was a credit that was not too far from Miles, you know what I mean? It wasn't, uh, oh, you're playing with Al Killian, that's great, man. you know? Uh, Miles, it, it, it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a great degree of space between them. What, I, what I'd like to get from you, since you've been an observer on the scene uh, for a number of years, is just your thoughts on different bands that Miles played with over the years. You know, one of the things we're doing on the site is breaking it down into chapters, different periods. Mm -hmm. I'm getting, for example, people's reaction to the first quintet, the second, the 60s quintet, and so forth. You probably saw some of these group lives, you witnessed this music. Just whatever comes to mind. Did you see the uh, quintet at Cafe Bohemia with Philly Joe and Coltrane? Do you remember that? No, but I worked opposite. Uh, it wasn't Philly Joe anymore. It was. Uh, um, I'm losing the names. You know who I mean? That. Jimmy Cobb. Jimmy Cobb, and it was Coltrane, and I was with Maynard, and this was 1959, maybe, and I, we were working Birdland, opposite that band. Any recollections of that group? <sighs> I didn't leave Birdland for you know from nine in the evening until three in the morning. I mean, yeah, I wasn't going to go out. I, well, maybe I'd get a cup of coffee, but I didn't go out between sets. No, and I also remember this is an old story by now. But that when we were on the stand, if we there was a slight rest, the, the train would be practicing. You'd hear train practicing in the kitchen and back. It was. I also remember a little anecdote that you know, and I was sitting at there was like a musician's table on the side, and I was sitting there listening to this you know mind blowing music. And Miles came over and sat down and said, What's Paul? What's Paul doing with the time? Paul fucking up the time. What's Paul doing with the time? And I mean, I listened, you know, and time sounded awful good to me. And uh, I said that to Miles, the time sounds pretty good to me. Huh? And he said, What's Paul? He totally ignored me. Said, What's Paul doing with the time? He got up and went on the stand and said something to Paul. I have no idea what. But uh, there was nothing wrong with that time. <laughs> What about the 60s quintet with Wayne and Herbie? That was something, uh, that started in the late 60s, right? It was, uh, it's actually 64 to 67, mm -hmm. 68. I kind of miss that in a sense that uh, I, I was working for my father and he had a small steel fabricating business. I, uh, I was confused. I didn't know whether I wanted to play music anymore. Uh, I I wasn't really touched by that band, touched in 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 the in the uh, you know hair hair raising and goose pimple raising mm -hmm. idea. But I admired it a lot, and it's a great band. And uh, I I uh, I can't say that it, it had such an, an such an enormous impact on me like Miles with Train, or for example, Miles uh, a Train with Monk, who I heard just about every night when they were at the Five Spot because I lived around the corner. Mm. I, I sublet a loft from a painter named Larry Rivers, and I used to go in there. I mean, you know, fifty cents for a glass of gin. I mean, uh, and it was five weeks, six weeks, and I'd just go in there every night, and and uh, that was a life changer, you know, in the, in the sense I mean. Uh, uh, Herbie and Wayne and those guys was never a life changer in, the, 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 in that sense, you know. I mean, they're great, great musicians and I loved it, but it, it wasn't something that I listened to for my heart. Does that make any sense? It does. Any thoughts on the direction you took at the end of the decade when they recorded Bitches Brew and went into the fusion thing? Well, uh, I'm one of the few people, I mean, I like the fusion thing. I, I didn't much care for Bitches Brew. But I think that uh, 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 Jack Johnson is one of his ten best records, Miles's. You know, uh, I like Miles' his so-called rock period. Richard's Brew, I just didn't, I didn't care for too much. It doesn't matter. In a silent way, I loved. Uh, I love to go to hear Miles in, in the '70s and '80s and that band he had with with Mike Stern and and and, uh, and Schofield uh, uh, with Bob Berg. I, Really enjoyed that music, and I thought that was really important to me. And you know, it was uh, uh, it was something I go out of my way to hear. Uh, it got a little bit.
tired at the end, but he was he was old, you know. He got, it, it got tired, but I mean, I I love the sound, and I I, I just love to hear Miles. Miles would still play a blues with that band. He'd play a slow blues, and it would be so beautiful, man. You know, and it didn't matter whether the band was rock or bebop or swing or cool or what have you. It was just a beautiful blues he was playing, and he could do that until you know the the year he died. He could still like really move you over. <coughs> You interviewed Miles a couple, several times during... Uh... Yeah, when I was a journalist and writing for the Herald Tribune in Paris, I probably interviewed him three, at least, probably four times. Once uh, it was uh, Miles, I did my Miles piece, uh, once was about his painting, once was about that movie he made with that, uh, uh, that Dutch director, which I think is better than... I think that's underrated, that movie. It's not bad. And uh, uh, there was another one in there somewhere. But uh, it was very hard for me to not write about Miles. In fact, it's still hard for me uh, not to write, not to have Miles' name in an article. It's, uh, I have a friend who writes on sports for the, for, the, for the Wall Street Journal, and his joke with me is, well, can you, th you think it's possible to write an article without Miles' name in it, Mike? <laughs> and I don't think it is. Well, yeah, it, it's, it, it keeps popping up, you know. Miles is still very much with us in that sense. What was he like to interview? Little wise ass, uh, but remember, I was I'm a musician, and I didn't ask him dumb questions. Uh, I think a lot of the times Miles got got uh, you know aggressive with people was because they they sort of asked for it. You know, they were asking dumb questions, and he was he was. Uh, I've heard other other journalists uh, questions, and I, I know I mean uh, whatever I'm not. I was a musician, and I know the I know the questions to to to, to ask. You know, and he responded. Uh, in accordance with the seriousness of the questions. Like, I remember once I asked him about how he gives signals, you know, because his back was to the audience, and I said, you know, how, is it signals? Or, you know, I don't, give, I don't give, we don't need signals here, you know. And he went into a, a, a nice little rap about that. And uh, I had the feeling that he hadn't really been asked that before, or not, not a lot. And, uh, you know, it, he was glad to answer it, and he did. Well, from the experience of first playing with him, and then later interviewing over the years, are there any other personal recollections you can share about Miles, things that might surprise us that we don't know about the man? Uh, it's hard for me to pull uh, things like that just out of the air without some reference for it. No, I'd have to say I can't think of anything now. I mean, I have images of walking into his suite at the Concorde Lafayette Hotel in Paris with, the, you know, the, the, he, Michael Shukat and, and the, whoever, the woman he was with at the time, the, the African prince side of Miles, which was pretty impressive, you know. Uh, he always had a young guy, a guy named Michael, I think, a black guy, who was studying painting. Beautiful guy, really nice and friendly. We used to talk a lot while I was waiting for Miles, he was always an hour late. And uh, I never minded him being an hour late, because I was in his room, you know, there were half-finished paintings and stuff like that. Uh, but I don't remember any particular, uh, I have images of Miles, right? Mm. A swimming pool on top of the hotel in Nice where the festival is. I dive in, I, put, I come up and there's Miles on the edge of the pool. You know? I mean, I'm in the water here and he's sitting here. What do you say? Good morning. <laughs> Looking great. Looking wonderful. Well, great. Anything else? But, uh... Well, there is one thing uh, that I always find uh, not uh, consistent, let's say. There are people who say that anything that Louis Armstrong plays is jazz. Jazz can be defined as anything Louis Armstrong plays, which I basically agree with. Yeah, that's true. But then why isn't anything that Miles plays jazz? Because that reasoning doesn't hold up as far as they're concerned. They wouldn't say the same thing about Miles. Miles played rock and he, and he didn't use his talent and, and you know, he messed up his talent or whatever. But if it applies that, 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 uh, that uh, Louis Armstrong singing Hello Dolly is jazz, as so is Time After Time played by Miles. I mean, I, 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 I see those two things as totally parallel. And uh, there was some kind of... Uh, uh, it was thought of as a betrayal, somehow, Miles playing rock. You know, how could he do this to us? It wasn't really rock, he was playing, whatever you want to call it.